late June 2016. For its 67th edition, the Formula One World Championship has set up in Baku on the shores of the Caspian Sea at the crossroad of Europe and Asia. Over the course of the weekend, this city circuit becomes a window into the automotive industry's most advanced technologies. 26 single-seaters racing from the European Grand Prix starting line and entrusted to the world's best pilots are at the height of cutting-edge technology. These incredible, sophisticated gems are displayed in the ideal setting. Baku, the capital of the Republic of Azerbaijan, is a city truly rooted in the 21st century. Its futuristic buildings proudly rise above monuments from the past, some ancient, giving the city its nickname, Pearl of the Caspian, bearing witness to the city's history, pre-Islamic ruins, Oriental-style medieval fortresses and palaces that are UNESCO World Heritage Sites, buildings and private homes from the flamboyant Art Nouveau era of the Rothschilds and Nobels, and finally, neoclassic Stalinist buildings that recall the 70 years of communist rule, which ended in chaos and poverty upon the collapse of the Soviet Union. How many of the passionate 20 million people watching the race from all corners of the world have any idea that 25 years earlier, this country was torn apart in financial collapse, with two thirds of the population living under the poverty level. The pearl had lost most of its shine. Yet, a quarter of a century later, the country shines once again, offering other Soviet republics the example of a remarkable resurrection. At the beginning of 1991, the Azerbaijani Republic is still socialist and part of the Soviet Union. Its leader, Ayaz Metalibov, is an apparatchik of the regime, put into power directly by Moscow, as is the case with all the Soviet Union's republics. Like elsewhere, this central power is increasingly contested and hated as it accumulates social and economic problems that perestroika and glasnost cannot resolve. Captain Gorbachev is having more and more difficulty keeping the USSR empire afloat. An empire whose destiny is reminiscent of the Titanic since it smashed into the Berlin Wall 18 months earlier to the bittersweet notes of a child of Baku, Mr. Slav Rostropovich. With each man fending for himself, old hostilities resurface, and after years of being under wraps, nationalism emerges once again. This is particularly the case in the South Caucasus, where the successive domination of three neighboring empires, the Sunni Muslim Ottomans, the Shiite Muslim Persians, and the Christian Orthodox Russians created great ethnic and religious shakeups, as well as territorial divisions that contributed to conflicts. In the 19th century, the Azerbaijani people were separated by a new frontier along the Araz River, with a quarter of the population in Azerbaijan and three quarters in the north of Iran. Azerbaijan is also completely separated from part of its territory, Nakhchivan, by a portion of Armenia. Furthermore, the Nagorno-Karabakh region, which is part of Azerbaijan, is populated by a majority of Armenians resettled there by Russia in the 19th and 20th centuries. Since 1988, in the wake of more relaxed Gorbachevian policies, these people demand their attachment to Armenia with increasing insistence. In response, progressively significant protests occurred one after the other in Baku, gathering up to 500,000 participants. Their leader is the ardent nationalist Abul Faz Elchibe, the head of Azerbaijan's Popular Front. 
the protesters refuse any partitioning of the country and demand the return of the independent republic of 1918, whose flag they carry. This first republic was born from the chaos of a bloody revolution which caused 15,000 deaths in Baku. After one century under Tsarist Russia, Azerbaijan became an independent nation. For the first time ever, a Muslim country established itself as a secular state and gave women the right to vote. But this new country would only enjoy its independence for 23 short months. On April 28, 1920, the 11th Red Army took back Baku, which had the same strategic value to Lenin just as it had to Tsar Nicholas II. At the beginning of the 20th century, Baku was the world's largest oil producer, responsible for more than 50% of global production. Its wells would continue to cover most of the Soviet Union's needs throughout the 1920s and 30s. In 1942, Hitler tried to seize these wells, but he was unable to cross the Caucasus Mountains, and Baku continued to supply 75% of the Red Army's needs. But things change after the war. Baku's wells were in large part dismantled or sabotaged at the end of 1942 in response to the German threat. They now only supply 25% of what they formerly produced. This will not suffice to reconstruct the Soviet economy destroyed by war. But the discovery in 1949 of a new oil field called Oily Rocks, the world's first ever offshore well to be exploited, will enable production to increase by 50% by the end of the 1980s. The situation could have improved greatly by exploiting new fields discovered in the Caspian Sea in the early 1970s. But at the time, Baku's oil is no longer a priority for Moscow. The bad economic situation and total disillusion over central power only encouraged the nationalists throughout 1989. On December 31st, incidents break out on the border that separates the Soviet Azerbaijanis from their ethnic brothers in Iran, opening the way for thousands to cross the border for the next two weeks. In Azerbaijan, even heavy police intervention doesn't prevent inter-ethnic clashes from claiming both Armenian and Azerbaijani lives. In the night of January 19, 1990, Soviet tanks enter Baku. The Soviet government has decided to stop the chaos and take control of the republic government feels is slipping away. That night, the army opens fire on the crowd peacefully gathered to protest against this Big Brother intrusion. The residents of Baku, in total disbelief and grief, tend to the 137 dead and 800 wounded, while the Red Army continues to hunt down the nationalists of the Popular Front. The next day, shock has given way to anger. Gorbachev is forever despised, but he has unwittingly managed to unite the Azerbaijani nation around its martyred heroes. Many communists hand in their party cards and a huge campaign to de-Russify names is launched. In Moscow, a former leader of Soviet Azerbaijan who has fallen from grace dared to challenge the authorities and showed up at the Azerbaijani representative office to vehemently denounce the Red Army's bloody intervention. Baku 
каким трагическим последствиям это привело, теперь уже хорошо нам известно. The man's name is Haydar Aliyev, and his destiny is an extraordinary one. Born in Nakhchivan, the highly intelligent son of a railway worker and a seamstress, he climbed the ranks of the nomenklatura to become the head of the Azerbaijani KGB and a ranked general. Then, for 13 years, he was first secretary of the Communist Party. His overwhelming success running the country caught the attention of Andropov and Brezhnev. Called to Moscow, Aliyev became a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and then the Politburo. In 1982, he was appointed the first deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, the highest position ever held by an Azerbaijani. When Konstantin Chernyenko died in March 1985, Aliyev voted in favor of Gorbachev succeeding him. Gorbachev graciously thanked him by ousting him from power and taking away his responsibilities. As a former leader of Azerbaijan with proven experience, Aliyev might be called to resume service in Baku, but Gorbachev decides otherwise. Aliyev will have to wait three years to finally return to lead the country, called to the rescue by new president Elchibe, totally overwhelmed by the situation. Meanwhile, Gorbachev was swept away by the breakup of the USSR, and Azerbaijan regained its status as a democratic republic with its flag and anthem of 1918. When Haydar Aliyev comes to power, the country is in a catastrophic situation. In the West, Azerbaijan is openly at war with Armenia, which occupies part of the country after throwing over one million IDPs on the roads of inner exile. Hostilities erupted in 1991 after Azerbaijan declared independence. The autonomous region of Nagorno-Karabakh then proclaimed itself as an independent republic, rejecting the authority of Baku. Although Armenia doesn't officially recognize the region as such, it provides it with important military support. The most violent fighting took place in February 1992 to gain control of the region's only airport in Hojali. The Armenians managed to seize this with the support of Russian units, but they committed a massacre among the fleeing civilians of Hojali city. The bodies of 613 elderly men, women, and children, some of them horribly mutilated, are left behind. This tragic episode will mark Azerbaijan's collective memory. To the north and south, small groups of local minorities supported from abroad threaten to secede. In Ganja, Colonel Husseinov, a rich patriot who financed a paramilitary militia of 3,000 men to fight in Nagorno-Karabakh, is in open rebellion against the power in Baku and threatens to invade the capital. The situation becomes untenable for President Elchibe especially since the country's economy is at its lowest. The oil and gas wells exploited for over 30 years show constantly decreasing yields. The cash reserves are non-existent and inflation rises at a staggering rate to 1130%. More than two thirds of the 7.5 million Azerbaijanis live below the absolute poverty line. Haider Aliyev begins by presenting his program to the parliament in Baku. Then he goes to Ganja to meet with Husanov and clarify the situation on the ground. Husanov will be subsequently appointed the prime minister of the country. He sends troops into seceding regions to restore order. On June 15, 1993, Aliyev is elected chairman of the parliament the second most important position in Azerbaijan. And he virtually becomes the number one man when Elchibe abandons his position and flees from Baku. Aliyev organizes presidential elections and wins a crushing and uncontested victory from his people, who see him as the savior of their homeland. 
On October 10th, he is officially inaugurated as the third president of Azerbaijan. Now the complex problem of Nagorno-Karabakh must be resolved. Despite receiving four condemnations from the UN Security Council, Armenia still refuses to return the land it occupies illegally. Haydar Aliyev opens up a series of discussions with his Armenian counterpart, Levan Terpetrosian, which results in a ceasefire in May 1994. With peace and stability re-established in Azerbaijan, the president can reopen the oil negotiations that he had stopped midway. He can bring in both the Russians and the Americans so as not to make waves with anyone. He is accompanied by his son Elam, a professor at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations until 1990, and now vice president of Soka, the national oil company. On September 20, 1994, Haydar Aliyev presides over the signing of an oil contract at the Gulustan Palace in Baku that will change Azerbaijan's destiny. He refers to this agreement as the contract of the century. This is a new kind of agreement, one that foresees sharing of production between a dozen operators of an international consortium created for this purpose, the AIOC. This consortium commits to investing $4 billion towards the exploitation of the ACG oil field, Azeri Chira Guneshli, located in the Caspian Sea, 120 kilometers off the coast of Baku. It will take three years for the first oil to spurt from Chirag 1 on November 7, 1997. <laughs> At the same time, Aliyev enters into discussions with the Russians over the modernization and use of the old baku Novorossiysk pipeline via Chechnya. But do not depend entirely on a single route as a landlocked state. Aliyev also negotiates with Edward Shevardnadze, his Georgian counterpart, to begin construction on a new pipeline, which will link Baku to Supsa on the Black Sea via the Southern Caucasus. The first tankers will dock there in 1999. But not everyone is happy with these maneuvers concerning the oil. Merely 10 days after the signing of the contract of the century, as Aliyev prepares to give his first speech in front of the United Nations General Assembly in New York, he learns that two of his close associates have been assassinated and that a putsch is taking place at home. Some troops supporting the rebellious prime minister, Colonel Husinov, are threatening Baku. Hader Eliyev urgently flies home and appeals to the population on live television. <laughs> At least 200,000 people, a significant crowd for a country of barely 7.5 million, gather in front of the presidential palace. Husanov flees from Baku. Other conspiracies are uncovered and stopped in the months that follow. The president is convinced he must consolidate stability and rule of law. On November 12, 1995, the population is called to vote on a new constitution for the country, which extends the president of the republic's power. They will also vote for 125 deputies, who, after four years of independence, will renew the parliament appointed by the communist regime. Ilam Aliyev is one of the newly elected deputies. The president now holds all the cards in his hand in order to jumpstart his country. 
He does not hesitate to explain to the population the reforms necessary to evolve from a collectivist economy to a free market economy. He restructures the banking sector. He privatizes industry and trade and deregulates prices. He implements a major agrarian reform and redistributes land to millions of farmers whose land had been seized by the kolkhozes. He begins addressing the major issue of the over one million people displaced by the war with Armenia, who represent one-tenth of the country's population. These people have nothing. They need food, housing, employment, and medical care. It will take the country 15 years to fully resolve this issue. The president has not forgotten that only a ceasefire was reached with Armenia. At any time, war could break out again. He increases the state's military budget, which by 1999 accounts for 14% of the country's total expenditures. All these measures bring forth quick results. Inflation falls from 1130 percent in 1993 to under 3% at the end of the decade, just as the first benefits of the contract of the century begin to emerge. Not surprisingly, Haydar Aliyev is comfortably re-elected in 1998 for a second term. After saving his country from complete financial meltdown, Aliyev must now focus on expanding Azerbaijan's foreign ties. He joins the European Union's Traseca, designed to facilitate communication between Europe and Asia. The idea is for Azerbaijan to become a crucial link again, as it once was on the ancient Silk Route traveled by Marco Polo. Already member of the CIS, the Confederation of Ex-Soviet Republics, in January 2001, he adheres to the Council of Europe. And after the terrorist attacks of September 11, he shows his commitment to the international fight against terrorism by opening Azerbaijan's airspace to American supply planes. To strengthen his diplomatic activity, he decides to structure Azerbaijan's voice overseas and organizes the first World Azerbaijani Congress in Baku, which gathers 400 delegates from 36 countries. September 18, 2002, with the presidents of Georgia and Turkey, Aliyev launches the construction of a giant $4 billion pipeline named BTC, running between the Caspian and Mediterranean seas. This day marks the culmination of three years of preparatory studies, which began in Istanbul with the signature of an agreement between the three presidents. United States President Bill Clinton attends the ceremony. Clinton is keen that his European allies obtain new sources for their energy supply. Departing from Sangachal Terminal, south of Baku, the pipeline will go through Bilisi in Georgia, all the way to Chehan on Turkey's Mediterranean coast. At a rate of two meters per second, the oil will cover the 1,768 kilometer route in about 20 days. At full capacity, it will carry one million barrels per day. It is one of the biggest infrastructure projects ever carried out in this part of the world. Haydar Aliyev won't live to see the completion of the project. Six months before the presidential election of 2003, Aliyev delivers a speech to the students of the Baku Military Academy, broadcast live on television. His speech is abruptly interrupted when he has a heart attack. He is nonetheless able to complete his speech to overwhelming applause. This first warning reminds him that he is now 80 years old. He appoints his son Elam prime minister in order to complete the work he has set out to do. Elam runs in the October presidential election and is elected.
two months later, Haydar Aliyev takes his final breath. One million tearful people accompany the father of the nation to his final resting place. Among the heads of state present are Vladimir Putin for Russia, Edward Shevardnadze and Mikhail Saakashvili representing Georgia, and Ahmed Cezar and Recep Erdogan for Turkey. Officials and ordinary civilians alike pay tribute to a man who has left the country in a far better state than when he found it 10 years earlier. The economy has taken off and life is much better for many Azerbaijanis. The GDP has consistently increased by 10% for three straight years. But there is still a lot to do. Although unemployment is back under 10%, it still affects one out of five young people. And although the country's poverty level has gone down by 25 points, it still hovers at around 45%. The new president is committed to pursuing the policies implemented by his father, re-establishing the domestic economy and maintaining a balanced foreign policy regarding the country's powerful neighbors. He has also shown his determination to resolve the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and to take back the territories illegally occupied by Armenia. However, it is clear that he has further ambitions. He wants to streamline the country according to the modern standards of the 21st century. Less than 15 years later, after being re-elected three times, Ilham Aliyev has achieved almost all of his goals. Azerbaijan has developed ties with the world's major powers, and as president, he has strong personal relationships with their leaders based on mutual cooperation and friendship. But the conflict with Armenia remains unresolved. One by one, the Europeans, Americans, and Russians have focused on the problem in Karabakh. Through their intermediary, the presidents of Azerbaijan and Armenia have met on 17 occasions over 13 years, without succeeding in reconciling their opposing positions. Azerbaijan demands the application of the four United Nations Security Council resolutions, all of which call for Armenia to withdraw troops from the occupied territories. Armenia, on the other hand, invokes the right of people to self-determination. Ceasefire violations occur regularly. To carry out the rest of his program, Ilham Aliyev has been able to take advantage of the growing oil revenues coming from the Caspian Sea. On the vast Azeri Chirag Duneshli oil field, whose reserves were initially estimated at 5.4 billion barrels, six production platforms and two treatment platforms pump oil to the Sangachal terminal in southern Baku through a network of underwater pipelines. In 2016, Azerbaijan becomes the 23rd largest oil producer in the world. And it's about to become a major producer of natural gas after the huge discovery in Shah Deniz, further south, of a trillion cubic meter gas field. Azerbaijan no longer needs to import foreign gas. In order to export this production to the West, a whole network of oil and gas pipelines has been developed as part of the New Silk Road. This initiative has further reinforced the country's transit potential. On July 13, 2006, the Jayan Terminal on the Mediterranean is inaugurated and the fully completed pipeline is opened. This ceremony marks the end of an incredible four-year adventure. This colossal undertaking has involved connecting 148,000 steel pipes, each measuring over one meter in diameter and 12 meters in length, burying them one meter below ground across mountains, transportation routes, and waterways, while preserving 300 archeological sites.
Several months after the inauguration of this oil pipeline, a second pipeline is built to export gas from Shah Deniz towards Georgia and Turkey. This South Caucasus pipeline is currently being doubled all the way to Erzurum by a second one, which will connect to two gas pipelines currently under construction, TANAP, Trans-Anatolian Pipeline, and TAP, Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, totaling a combined length of 3,500 kilometers these pipelines will enable Azerbaijan to become a major gas exporter to Europe. Other constructions are also part of the new Silk Road project, such as a four-lane, 1,100-kilometer-long highway. The first section from Baku to Ajigabu was inaugurated in May 2005 and links Baku to Belisi, Batumi, and Trabzon. Another project is the construction of the baku belisi kars railway line with the plans to connect Baku to the line going to Istanbul. The line, opened in 2017, will ultimately be able to transport up to 3 million passengers per year and 20 million tons of cargo. Once the rail tunnel under the Bosporus is completed, Europe's major capitals will be 10 days from Beijing by train. In Azerbaijan, financing these great infrastructure projects has been managed by SOFAS, an organization specifically created in 1999 for this purpose. Ilham Aliyev inaugurated its new headquarters in 2014. SOFAS is a sovereign fund, transparently managing and investing oil revenues, redistributing them to maintain the country's economic and social stability, and working on projects for future generations. For instance, SOFAS has provided aid to the over one million displaced people from the war with Armenia. Thanks to this assistance, the nation's IDPs have been progressively transferred into new housing structures and reintegrated into the country's economic life. The last refugee relief camp was closed on February 7, 2008. SOFAS also helped finance one of the most important public projects of the decade. The drinking water supply brought to Baku from the Caucasus Mountains, 400 kilometers away. To facilitate administrative logistics, in December 2012, President Aliyev inaugurates Asan, regrouping the various administrative services under one roof and also traveling through the countryside to meet its constituents. Poverty has decreased dramatically throughout Azerbaijan, falling from 45% in 2003 to 5% in 2016. When the average annual revenue per citizen was multiplied by eight, reaching $6,500. The country has experienced staggering double digit growth, hitting a peak of 34% in 2006. To escape the so-called resource curse, when producing nations are hostage to price fluctuations from commodity exports, the president has sought to develop non-oil sectors such as services, tourism, and agriculture. In 2004, the latter benefited from the program for the socio-economic development of regions. In 2016, the sector represented 37% of the nation's workforce and 6% of the country's GDP. Oil aside, the industrial sector is also expanding, supported by significant iron, copper, and aluminum resources. In 2016, its share in the GDP was 13%. The country has also begun producing its own light weapons and ammunitions to reduce its dependence on imports. 
In 2016, the Azerbaijani army's annual budget reached the amount of $4.8 billion, 10 times greater than in 2004. In 2013, the first Azerbaijani telecommunications satellite is launched from Kourou in French Guiana. At the same time, the internet continues to develop, thanks to the construction of a fiber optic network and the emergence of a local high-tech industry. To train the necessary staff for these different areas of activity, a large scholastic and university infrastructure is launched in 2004, thanks to the Haydar Aliyev Foundation. Azerbaijan's first lady, Mariban Alieva, who has presided over the foundation since its creation in 2004, works in close coordination with UNESCO and ISESCO, for which she has become a goodwill ambassador since 2004 and 2006, respectively. Thanks to the foundation's support, hundreds of primary and secondary schools have been opened across the country, with 130 opened in 2006 alone. The literacy rate is close to 100%. The foundation's support also allowed the government to launch an important educational program to send Azerbaijani students to top universities abroad. More broadly, the Haydar Aliyev Foundation supports the government's cultural initiatives. In 2008, it participates in the creation of the Mugam Center, dedicated to the conservation and promotion of the country's traditional music as an integral part of its cultural heritage. The foundation is also involved in the organization of music festivals, like the one in Gabala. and concerts abroad. The foundation has also financed the creation of an Islamic art room at the Louvre in Paris and the restoration of certain works from the collection of the Pio Clementino Museum at the Vatican. The goal of all these initiatives is to give Azerbaijan its rightful place on the international stage, as dictated by its strategic position at the intersection of two major axes, between the Slavic world to the north and the Arab Persian world to the south, and between Europe to the west and Asia to the east. As a result, in May 2012 and October 2013, Ilham Aliyev takes over the revolving presidency of the UN Security Council as a non-permanent member. The 6,765th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. Ilam Aliyev wants his Muslim but secular country, as a protector of all religions, to build a bridge between the Christian and Muslim worlds. To this end, he rolls out the red carpet for Pope Francis on his apostolic journey in 2016. He also multiplies his country's membership to major international organizations and makes Baku an increasingly credible destination for hosting major international forums. To attract events of this scale, the logistic infrastructures must be up to par. From 2006 onwards, major architectural projects designed by prestigious professionals begin to emerge. The old black city in Baku, with all its oil, has progressively given way to a beautiful white city cleaned of all pollution and rich in futurist projects.
projects that echo the audacity of the iconic flame towers, inaugurated in 2013 in the very heart of the city. Built at the same time as the flame towers, the Haydar Aliyev Cultural Center was designed by the Iraqi British architect Zaha Hadid, the first woman to receive the Pritzker Prize, the Nobel Prize for Architecture. The center is composed of a conference center, a museum, a library, and a 22-acre park. Crystal Hall was built in just eight short months to host the 2012 Eurovision competition. This popular event was broadcast in the 42 participating countries and allowed 64 million viewers to discover Azerbaijan and see the country's winning performance the previous year in Germany again. The 68,000 seat Olympic Stadium is inaugurated in March 2015 to host the first European Games three months later and Islamic Solidarity Games in 2017. Each of the Games was a great success for the host country, which took respectively second and first place in the medal table. The state has efficiently used these international events to develop the nation's brand and boost tourism, and the impact is finally starting to be felt. The entire country is being structured to this end, from the foothills of the Caucasus to the beaches of the Caspian. In this country where women and men have equal rights, the whole population, driven by its youth, benefit from these major transformations. There is a striking contrast between this Muslim country, proud of its traditions yet genuinely secular, taking the path of modernization and development, and the chaos and instability plaguing its neighborhood. There is no doubt that in this changing world of the 21st century, Azerbaijan will be called upon to play an increasingly important role because of its strategic location at the intersection of many routes and civilizations.